1887, while uh, Louis Sullivan's auditorium building was uh, under construction, he hired a young man named Frank Lloyd Wright as a draftsman and a kind of apprentice. And quickly, uh, Wright became one of Sullivan's assistant designers. Then in just a few years, Wright was designing houses on his own. He set up his own practice, became a successful architect, and by about 1900, was producing designs that were significantly original and pointed the way to, uh, a ma to major new developments in American architecture. Now here's a photograph of, of Wright. This is a, a later photograph, of course, from the period I've just been describing when he was a very young man. Wright was uh, also, of course, to become the most famous American architect and even a kind of legend. And whenever that happens to, uh, to someone, it uh, becomes uh, difficult to see them objectively, I think, to separate the legend from the real person. In, a, in the case of Frank Lloyd Wright, another thing that complicates an understanding of him and his, and his work is the sheer length of his career and the, and the volume of his uh, work and the buildings he designed. He continued uh, designing and producing architecture right up until the, uh, until the time of his death in 1959. Uh, he had a very long life. He lived uh, until the, to the age of 92, and, and he was active and, um, and productive right up until the very end. And, and since he had be also begun his career very young, this means that he had uh, an almost um, incredibly long active career of over 70 years. It may be unprecedented in the, um, in the history of architecture, at least for any major architect. Also, his work went through many different uh, periods, styles, each one of them highly original and in some ways uh, very different from, uh, from one another. And just as a suggestion of this, let me uh, compare one of his early prairie houses this is the Roby House in Chicago from 1909 that we'll be seeing um, a little later. And compare that with one of his uh, designs uh, first of the 1920s. This is a um, uh, house in Los Angeles built out of concrete blocks. Or a building from the 1930s, famous Falling Water, the Kaufman House in western Pennsylvania using uh, reinforced concrete technology, or one of his very last buildings, the Guggenheim Museum in New York, uh, built in the 1950s, constructed when he was uh, about 70, or about 90 years old. And uh, you can see how, uh, how different in character, at least um, from a superficial glance at all of them, how different they all seem. Well, the um, the vitality and, and creativity of his work in each of these uh, periods of his career is really amazing. But in certain ways, I think his early work is the most significant, though it doesn't necessarily uh, include his most famous buildings, uh, Falling Water and the Guggenheim Museum. But uh, uh, apart from this question of which are the most famous or most recognizable of his buildings, I uh, feel that it's his early career which in uh, certain ways is the most significant in its innovations and its um, influence on American architecture. So today I'd like to um, examine the early period of his work, that is up to about 1910, and examine it in, in some detail. And this also will give us the opportunity to look at the formative stages of a young architect's career, something that um, we don't normally do uh, in a survey course like this. One tends to look at uh, uh, an architect rather uh, quickly, pick out uh, uh, one or more of, uh, of the most um, important or famous buildings and uh, just focus on those as though somehow they just kind of came out of nowhere or, else, or that they represent some kind of creativity that the architect always had. And it kind of suggests the kind of genius uh, 
uh, description of, um, of, of a great artist. But this, so I think it's good, at least in this one case, and of course one doesn't have the time in a survey course like this to do it with, with many architects, but here in one case to really look at the formative stage and to see how an architect's uh, uh, work uh, uh, developed or evolved from the beginning. Well, so first a little uh, background about his life. Frank Lloyd Wright was born in uh, 1867 near a small town called Spring Green in the farmlands of, uh, of Wisconsin, a place where he later returned to, um, to live. I think I have another slide of this. And when he was born here in, um, in uh, uh, Wisconsin in 1867, this, of course, was really the um, American frontier, or it was, it was uh, far from the centers of, uh, of, uh, of culture. He, uh, and he later returned to, the, to this spot in uh, Wisconsin to live and uh, built his house and studio there, which he named uh, Taliesin. House of his. Taliesin is a, uh, a Welsh word that he adopted for, uh, for his house, both here in Wisconsin and then uh, uh, when he created another establishment school in, uh, in Arizona, which he called Taliesin West. And, um, and I think there's no question that Wright's origins in this rural place, even in a semi frontier kind of place, was uh, uh, that is. His origins here were, were significant for his development, giving him a profound love of nature and of natural building materials, and also a, a preference for architecture uh, that's in the country rather than in, uh, in cities. Though he did, of course, design some urban buildings like the Guggenheim Museum, but they're really exceptions to most of his uh, work, which is either rural or suburban. At heart, I think, um, he was part of that American frontier or agrarian tradition of uh, rugged individualism and a belief in natural forces more than social institutions, all of which comes out strongly in his writings as well, which often uh, recall the ideas of, uh, of Emerson and, and Thoreau or Walt Whitman, though uh, his writings aren't quite as good as uh, those of uh, of those literary uh, figures, uh, Wright uh, wrote a lot, but uh, I think there's no doubt that he was a better architect than, than a writer, and sometimes his writings are a little frustrating, uh, somewhat difficult to read, though they, they're impassioned and they have a poetic quality about them, and they, can, but they, uh, they certainly reflect his, uh, his personality in a very uh, uh, passionate kind of way. Well, this. Um, these aspects, these frontier aspects, and his love of uh, nature and his romanticism in, in this regard, are all of these, I think, are some of the reasons that Wright was um, especially interested in domestic architecture, more than public or institutional buildings. And certainly, by far, uh, the, uh, the majority, the great majority of Frank Lloyd Wright's work is, uh, is houses, domestic houses. For him, the family was the important social unit. And his designs reflect the importance of the family in, in many ways. For example, in the emphasis they give to, uh, to a massive central fireplace often as a, as a kind of uh, symbol of the, uh, of the stability of the family unit gathered protectively around, uh, around a hearth. And here we see uh, just one of, of these. This is the, um, the fireplace, the hearth area of uh, falling water. Pennsylvania, Hoffman House. Wright's childhood, however, was not exactly typical of the uh, frontier. His father was a minister from the East who was um, interested in philosophy and, and music and other intellectual things. And his mother also was, uh, uh, was well educated, though she was eccentric in certain ways and, and perhaps even mentally unbalanced, according to some. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, it was not a perfect uh, family situation by any means. His parents were divorced when he was young, and this was a really a shameful thing in, in, in those days. And uh, 
certainly left, uh, left its mark on, on him and other members of the family. And some biographers have uh, suggested that the somewhat disturbed family life that uh, Wright grew up in also contributed to uh, the later emphasis that he put on the importance of the ideal home in architecture as a uh, kind of um, compensatory sort of uh, way. And, um, but in any case, Wright um, knew he wanted to be an architect from an early age, and his mother urged him on in this, uh, in this ambition. She was very ambitious for him. And there, there's even a wonderful uh, story that he later told, it's a little hard to believe maybe, but that she knew he was going to be an architect even before he was born, and uh, that she put uh, engravings of uh, Gothic cathedrals up on the nursery walls and so forth. They're, they're wonderful stories like this. So he was sort of marked out uh, uh, by his family and by him in his own mind as a, as a, a, a great uh, person and an architect. Also, it was, it was certainly an unusual idea for somebody to want to be an architect on the American frontier. Uh, you'd think that that, I mean, that that would be a more natural kind of um, ambition for someone living in cities with lots of buildings. So his, this background of his is very interesting and certainly unusual. Well, after, and there weren't really any schools you could go to in the, certainly in the, in the Midwest to, uh, to study architecture at that time. He, uh, so after he finished public school, he attended the University of Wisconsin briefly, uh, but there was no architecture department there. He uh, studied some engineering and a little bit of this and that, and, but, uh, but then uh, left after a year or so and, and just and got a job with an engineer in Madison, uh, Wisconsin. And then in um, 1887, went to Chicago. And through some um, family connections uh, that he had on his, uh, on his mother's side, uh, he uh, managed to get a job with an architect named Lyman Silsby. Not a terribly well-known architect, but he was uh, typical of, the, of this uh, period in the 1880s. Actually, he was, he was uh, an up-to-date architect who specialized in the newly popular shingle style. And here we just see a uh, design for um, uh, Silsby's designs for a building in Chicago, which, as uh, you see from the drawing, is uh, uh, typical of the shingle style and, and of some of those buildings by Richardson that we uh, uh, saw, maybe like his uh, Watts uh, Sherman house in uh, the picturesque character of the house, the, uh, uh, those arches and uh, other uh, uh, aspects of it. And you can uh, see how similar this is to the first building that Frank Lloyd Wright himself designed. This is still in 1887, when he's just 20 years old. This, um, you can uh, see that he's clearly drawing on the work of, uh, of this uh, Van Silsby and other things that Wright probably saw in architectural magazines of the, uh, of the period, of the latest uh, styles. Uh, again, uh, uh, made of uh, shingles and with a, with a very prominent gable roof like this that uh, uh, other things are gathered underneath and then the porch with the, uh, with the rounded arches. And so it's uh, uh, clearly just, uh, there's nothing special about it at all. It's uh, just what other people were doing at this uh, period. Well, the, the, the same year, in 1887, when he was 20 years old, Wright moved from uh, Silsby's office to the office of Lewis Sullivan, where he was to stay for, uh, for seven years and really learn the profession of architecture from, uh, from Sullivan. More than any other person, Sullivan was the, uh, was the teacher of, um, of Wright. And in fact, for the rest of his life, uh, Wright called Sullivan his master and was, uh, and was very uh, open in, uh, in uh, admitting the, the great influence that Sullivan had on him. Wright was generally not very uh, willing to, uh, uh, to admit influences from other people, but in Sullivan's case, it is clear that he really had learned architecture from Sullivan. Even though there was um, some tension between the two of them, even starting quite early while they were, when he was working for Sullivan, they were, had, both had very strong personalities and in some ways were somewhat uh, uh, difficult. But despite that, Sullivan was, was a great uh, influence on his early career. After only uh, two years of working for Sullivan, Wright was so confident of his ability and his future career that he borrowed money and built a house for himself, this house, in the uh, Chicago suburb of Oak Park for himself and his, and his family. He had just gotten married. 
He was obviously a very a ambitious person who uh, wanted to move quickly in everything he did. Also, his mother was still urging him on. She'd moved to Chicago with him and uh, lived with him and his, uh, and his new wife and family, or actually, or next door, actually. <laughs> his relationship with his mother was, uh, was complex, and it's, uh, it's analyzed, has been analyzed in some detail in a recent biography of Wright by uh, Brendan Gill, a book that's, uh, that's not actually very useful, I think, for understanding Wright's architecture, but it is very provocative and interest interesting for his private life. So if you, if you want to uh, read all of this, in, in some cases, somewhat embarrassing or, uh, details of, uh, of Wright's private life, uh, Brendan Gill's book is the, uh, is the one to read. It doesn't necessarily help you understand his architecture as well as other things that you could read would. Well, and like the, um, the house for, um, for his aunt, so I neglected to mention that this, um, that this uh, house over on the, on the left here, he designed for, for two maiden aunts of his uh, back in, in Wisconsin, it's, uh, in this place, Spring Green, Wisconsin. They were named uh, Lloyd Jones, these aunts, and uh, so that's why the house is called the Lloyd Jones House, but it actually was also a nursery school. They ran a successful nursery school, and the building contained both the, uh, the school or a kind of um, daycare center and, and school and the, the residence for these uh, two women that uh, they lived in the house as well. Well, like that house, uh, the, uh, the house he built for himself in Oak Park outside of Chicago on the right here is, as you can see, a typical shingle style design of, of the building. In fact, he probably uh, had, w had based it on designs by a New York architect named Bruce Price and here we see one of um, uh, Price's uh, uh, houses that uh, was published, uh, as I, I think I mentioned before, by, by now, at the e toward the end of the uh, 19th century, there are uh, lots of architectural magazines in, in America, as well as uh, Europe, that, uh, that any practicing architect or young person interested in architecture would be able to find you know, in, in any American uh, city and libraries and so forth or in the offices of uh, Lewis Sullivan. So ideas move around uh, uh, much more quickly now than they certainly had uh, earlier in the 19th century. And, um, the, uh, and, and so there's this uh, house by uh, Bruce Price, which is somewhat like uh, maybe that uh, low house of, of a Kim Eden White we saw where everything is gathered under the, uh, uh, the roof. And it's, you can see that it seems as though uh, Wright was looking at that when he uh, built his own house. And this points out, I think, that even great creative artists usually start out by copying and learning from the people around them. And it often takes some time for their really innovative ideas to, uh, to materialize. Somehow we have this kind of romantic idea that uh, the great geniuses just always have uh, uh, innovative ideas right from the uh, beginning and that they don't really need to, uh, to learn from anyone else. But certainly in the case of Frank Lloyd Wright, this is this is not uh, true. He's a good example of this. For the next 10 years or so, that is, and this now is the period of the 1890s, basically, that we're talking about, he, um, he designed many houses. First, in Sullivan's office. Sullivan was mainly concerned during this period with those large commissions, uh, uh, like the auditorium building and the skyscrapers. And, uh, and so when domestic designs or commissions for domestic houses came into Sullivan's office, he would often turn them over to, uh, to Frank Lloyd Wright, and as a result, uh, Wright uh, got to design uh, a lot on his own, and it was mainly these domestic uh, commissions that Sullivan wasn't particularly interested in. So first in Sullivan's office, he designed a lot of houses, and then on his own, when he set up his own practice in Oak Park, uh, where he um, uh, had this house outside Chicago. And when we examine these uh, designs, from the 1890s, almost all for houses, as I mentioned, we see that he was trying out everything, obviously studying all the styles that were current in the architectural world and struggling to find his own um, architectural identity. He did shingle-style houses like these. He did some classical revival uh, uh, houses that um, look like um, uh, almost copies of uh, federal style or Georgian houses. I don't happen to have any slides of these here. Even some Gothic revival houses. Uh, here is a uh, uh, house in a kind of Tudor style. 
Most of these are not, have not been uh, uh, published, and, and these are uh, slides that I uh, took myself uh, when I tracked down some of these a number of years ago. And here's another that's even that's harder to classify, uh, just what it is, what style it is. He later, right, later tried to forget the, these early houses of his, or even maybe suppress them to some extent, or certainly never published them. But you can see he was trying everything, and all of them are, are styles that he could have uh, found or assembled from things that other people were doing. Though the house on the right is one of the, sort of an odd one, it's hard to really figure that one out. And um, if we look at a detail of this house on the right, this is the uh, detail of the front door, as you can see. And uh, it's uh, uh, an old black and white uh, photograph I uh, came across. But um, it uh, shows the house before it was painted. This uh, originally uh, was probably just natural plaster surface there. And so the colors are wrong on the, on the um, photograph on the right. But I show this detail of the uh, front door uh, so that you can see it a little uh, better. There's this arch with. Uh, uh, ornament uh, around the arch, and then these uh, uh, boulders that uh, these natural rocks that uh, build up around the door. A strange uh, combination of elements. Where do you think he got these ideas? Can do you have any uh, sense of where uh, what he was looking at when he uh, designed this house, or at least this front door part of it? Okay, and in particular, anything particular of Richardson? Yeah, that Ames Cave Lodge, I think so. I think he must have been looking at that or similar things by, uh, by Richardson or other architects. The idea of, of a, uh, an entranceway with an arch and, uh, and these natural boulders that seem to grow out of the rock. It's, he clearly, I think, is looking at Richardson's work. And then for the, um, but around the door itself here, I think he's looking at Sullivan's ornament, which naturally he was very familiar with. And in fact, he actually helped uh, uh, Sullivan design some of that uh, detailed and intricate ornament that uh, uh, Sullivan used for his um, uh, uh, skyscrapers and other public buildings. So, um, so Wright is, is combining these uh, two um, uh, sources, Sullivan and Richards, and here in a kind of peculiar, we might even say a sort of awkward way in this, uh, in this doorway. Uh, a couple of these uh, early houses from the 1890s, however, do stand out above the rest, especially when we see them in, in retrospect with our knowledge of Wright's uh, later uh, work. And especially one of them um, is uh, interesting and uh, more, um, uh, more relevant to his later work than some of these other, than these other uh, buildings we've seen. And it's called the Winslow House of uh, uh, 1893 in uh, the town of River Forest, another one of these suburbs around uh, Chicago. Uh, when you're looking or reading about um, Wright's early work or uh, looking at the, uh, uh, the handout uh, of, uh, for this week, the, um, you see all these different uh, uh, places, uh, uh, suburbs of Chicago, Oak Park, River Forest, Highland Park is another one I think we'll, we'll be seeing a building from. And, uh, the, it's not important to remember the names of those places. If you just think of them as the area around uh, Chicago, that these, is the, these are suburban communities around uh, uh, Chicago, including uh, 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 that uh, suburb Riverside that, uh, uh, that Olmsted designed. Well, there's a, here in the Winslow House in River Forest, there's a, um, a kind of classical order, one might say, about the, about the design, though. There's nothing specifically classical or Bible. We don't see columns or pilasters or, or capitals. And yet there's something about the spirit of the house which is uh, classical. It has this uh, symmetry. The whole design is unified by the uh, dominating um, uh, horizontal lines. So he's, he's, he's um, moving away from the picturesque here. It's, it's as almost as though he's trying something where he's, he's uh, getting rid of that. Uh, uh, a peculiar kind of picturesque that, uh, that we see in the slide on, on the left of combining uh, unusual things together. And now he's, he's trying for a more unified kind of style and the deeply overhanging uh, roof. Also this theme of the horizontal and uh, unity of the house is emphasized, I think, by the way he divides up the, two, uh, the, the facade of the house into these uh, two um, uh, bands which actually do not correspond with the floor of the house. As you can see by this window up here, the actual the floor of the second floor is probably down here. Uh, so it's, this is more an aesthetic thing he's doing. He's not really showing us where the, uh, where the two floors are. It's, he wants to create a, uh, a, 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 this horizontal feeling by uh, 
uh, uh, having these um, uh, bands and giving this a, a darker color. It actually has a pattern, a kind of Sullivan-esque pattern stenciled into it. It's a little hard to see in this uh, slide. But he, he wants it darker than the, than the rest of the house, partly maybe to emphasize the shadow, to emphasize this overhanging uh, roof and to make it look like that's, that whole thing is a shadow maybe. So he's playing with these very basic uh, visual uh, aspects. But even here, there are some clear borrowings from other architects. And in particular, look at this um, detail around the front door. I think maybe I have a, another slide showing it in more detail. Here, here it is. The, um, and again, this is an unusual kind of way to, to treat a, uh, a front door where it's integrated in with these windows with a, a band that kind of meanders around uh, that has this uh, uh, detailed ornament on it. Does that remind you of anything we've seen before? I just saw it briefly last time. This tomb, the Wainwright tomb that uh, Sullivan had actually designed just the year before in, in 1892. So here again, it's, he's clearly drawing on uh, the work of uh, other architects, and in particular Sullivan, understandably. And at the same time, uh, Wright uh, seems to have been influenced by another, but somewhat more, more unusual or less, uh, less expected source, which was Japanese architecture, which he knew about from uh, books, but also more directly from a uh, Japanese pavilion at the Chicago World's Fair. This is exactly the time, of course, of the Chicago World's Fair, 1893, when he designs the Winslow House. and. Um, so he uh, uh, clearly uh, attended the Chicago World's Fair. We know from his writings that he was very familiar and interested in it, as everyone in Chicago was. And there was a um, there was a Chicago there was a Japanese uh, pavilion at the Chicago World's Fair. This building, or a group of buildings, actually that were um, uh, constructed there. And among the aspects that uh, uh, apparently appealed to uh, Wright in, uh, in Japanese architecture in general, but also specifically in this building, was the, um, were the dominant uh, roof that, uh, again, often in Japanese architecture extends out and creates a very prominent kind of form that seems to be a kind of sheltering form for, the, for a house. Also, the Japanese wall system with its um, contrast of natural wood members and light infill uh, panels, uh, often of uh, plaster or sometimes even uh, um, uh, paper, less um, less substantial uh, materials, and um, but but more basically, I think uh, what appealed to him in Japanese architecture was the sense of interior planning, with walls that can can slide open to make spaces flow into one another, and into and, and to the to the outdoors as well, so that there. Uh, there's a much more open relationship between inside and outside and uh, uh, between different rooms inside a house. This uh, slide on the left is, is not a photograph of the uh, pavilion at the Chicago World's Fair, of course, but it's, um, uh, it's, it's a, uh, a building in, um, uh, in Kyoto, uh, the Katsura Villa, one of the famous uh, 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 Japanese um, houses of the uh, royal family uh, that was well uh, known and, and uh, published in, in books and the sort of thing that Wright could have known about from, um, from reading. And many of these um, aspects start to appear in Wright's work at uh, about the end of the 1890s when he begins finally to synthesize a uh, true style of his own which he came to call the Prairie House which draws on many of these aspects that I've uh, uh, suggested, uh, plus uh, others, but that are, can't be considered copies of any of them. So he took, took ideas and concepts from all sorts of places and then found some way of synthesizing them together, finally into a, uh, a style of his own, this um, uh, prairie house style, as he called it. And here we see a kind of transitional design in, the, in this process or the Prairie House. It's called the Bradley House in uh, Kankakee, Illinois, which is a um, town just north of, um, of Chicago, built in just in 1900. And you can see it has a long uh, uh, projecting roof, or roofs, that suggest uh, 
of Japanese architecture to some extent, though again not really copying them precisely. It has a light plastered surfaces that are outlined by natural wood uh, trim. Again, looks somewhat Japanese. And then the, but other things, uh, the windows, for example, are all banked together, or in many cases are, rather than being separate windows punched into a wall, he uh, gets the idea here that he likes to have windows uh, right next to one another to create whole spaces now, or whole op larger areas of openness in the, um, in the walls. And I'll get back to that a little um, later. All of these things contribute to the, uh, to the low horizontal quality of the design, which uh, Wright felt was sympathetic to the landscape of the uh, region. And this, of course, is one of the uh, reasons he calls them uh, prairie houses. Uh, Wright, at this time, was very consciously trying to create an American architecture, but more specifically, an architecture of the American Midwest, the, the prairie uh, country. And um, I don't know whether you can uh, see this very clearly in the slide on the right. This is, uh, of course, an old black and white photograph of the house shortly after it was uh, built. And if you look here, you can see under the, the port cochere, this area that leads uh, uh, the, the driveway goes through to the stable behind. You see the horse and buggy. And it's, uh, there's uh, something like a kind of uh, a jolt, I think, to re realize the, or to see something like this and makes us realize how long ago this was, that this is uh, really the, the end of the 19th century, the horse and buggy era, and, uh, and uh, uh, emphasizes, I guess, the, um, the innovative nature of the architecture that uh, Wright was creating at this time. Well, the following year, in 1901, Wright designed a house for a publication in the Ladies' Home Journal that uh, was publishing uh, house designs, had asked a number of architects to, uh, to submit uh, designs for um, relatively modest houses. It was in that tradition of, uh, of uh, publications for mass consumption uh, that would suggest uh, uh, style, uh, plans for um, for houses that ordinary Americans could build, going back to that tradition of, uh, of Andrew Jackson Downing. And you know, so by now, a number of American uh, magazines and publications, uh, like Ladies Home Journal, they would uh, publish these designs. And uh, uh, Wright uh, actually did a number of these for the uh, Ladies Home Journal. Uh, this is uh, one that he uh, published in, the, um, in 1901, as I say, that he uh, called a home for a prairie town. And on the right is, um, is not the actual page of the way it appeared in the Ladies' Home Journal. Uh, these are uh, uh, plans and a section drawing, and on the left, the um, uh, perspective drawing of the exterior, as you can see, uh, that, that here were later published in a book on Frank Lloyd Wright. So that's not actually, we're not actually seeing the page from the Ladies' Home Journal. And we see the, the same basic forms uh, here, but I think more clearly worked out and, and more unified. You can see, for example, on the, um, on the left in the perspective drawing how the, uh, where the driveway goes through here and there's this porte cochere, as I guess technically it would be called. The, um, the, the roof for it is not separate from the house. It extends through and it really is the same roof that wraps around and, and, and goes the whole length of the house. So it tends to it unifies it and emphasizes that, um, uh, that horizontal quality of the house reflecting the, the flat landscape, the prairie landscape. And in the, um, uh, the plans and the section drawings that we see on the, on the right here, this, is, this may look a little funny as a, as a section drawing. It's a little different from the way we're used to seeing them. And I don't know exactly why it was uh, done like uh, this. But normally, as you recall, when you have, uh, do a section drawing through a building, uh, you, you're, you're cutting through the walls and, and the roof and the floors. And, and those are shown in, uh, often in black lines so that you can actually see the width of the uh, of the walls and the floor, whereas here we don't have that. It's, uh, like, it's sort of like a section drawing without the actual walls and, uh, uh, and roof, and I don't know exactly why. It's, not, it's, not a, uh, it's a little confusing a, as a result. But it does show us how the, uh, the spaces are organized inside. This is the, um, the first floor plan of the house, and the section drawing. Whenever you see a section drawing and plans, you want to try to uh, relate them so that you can, can read them, as architects say, and understand what's, uh, what's going on. And in this case, the, uh, the section at the bottom there is cut through this part of the house with a, a line like, like that. And then we're looking this way. Uh, and, we, and therefore, we see the fireplace 
down here, and these two rooms, the library and the uh, dining room. And I think you can see from the plan that they're uh, completely open to one another, very, very wide doors, so that they're really almost the same uh, uh, a room. And it's part of this openness that uh, had, Wright did not uh, begin this, this process. We saw it actually beginning earlier in uh, the designs of H.H. Richardson, for, for example. But he takes it much farther, and probably, again, inspired to some extent by Japanese architecture, where rooms are, can be opened up uh, and be completely open to one another. Also, you can see from the section drawing that the, uh, that the living room, the uh, central space here, actually is, uh, rises up through the, uh, up into the second uh, floor. And, the, and so it's an open space and it has a kind of balcony looking uh, down on it. Now, it is true that when you look at the plan for that over here, you can see that on the upper floor, he's showing bedrooms here. And the reason for that, he explains that in a, in a text which went along uh, with the, um, this article in the Ladies' Home Journal where he uh, talks about how uh, this is really the, would be the ideal way to, uh, to design the, the living room so it has this extra space and is dramatic and, uh, and creates a more complex space for the uh, uh, living spaces of the house, but that if a family didn't um, need extra bedrooms and couldn't afford to, uh, to use the space that way, that they could uh, have bedrooms upstairs in set instead. And, and that, again, is in that tradition of these um, pattern books like Downing's uh, designs that uh, were meant to be practical and that could be used by houses of, uh, for houses of uh, clients of modest means. And, um, but we see already here this writes um, of interest in creating complex interior spaces that are open onto one another in, in, in various ways, different ceiling heights. That's to become a, um, a, a basic uh, component of his, um, of his work. All of these uh, aspects that I've been suggesting were developed even further in the first um, really great prairie house, I think, that Wright uh, executed. And it was one of the, uh, the largest he did at this time. The commission he got uh, from a family named Willits, the Willits House uh, in Highland Park, which is another of these uh, Chicago suburbs. And this was in 1902. So here I think we can see, say, that the, that the prairie house, the full-fledged prairie house, has, um, has arrived. And we see here, of course, a, a floor plan on the, um, on the right and Wright's perspective rendering of the house over on the left. These are drawings that he or in his office. By this time, he was not working alone. He had uh, 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 a staff, a small staff of, uh, of assistants in his, uh, in his office, which was next to his house in uh, Oak Park. And um, he, he and his uh, assistants would uh, design a house and then uh, often do these very beautiful perspective drawings to, uh, to show to the clients and also to, um, uh, uh, to have as records of, um, of his uh, concept of the way the house uh, uh, was to look. We'll see a photo of the house in a minute, but the, this perspective drawing is not only a very beautiful drawing, but it, it helps us understand, I think, the character the Wright intended for these um, prairie houses to have. Also, I might note that, um, that even though Wright developed the basic uh, concept of these, of these drawings, uh, and, and, and it, they clearly were partly inspired again by Japanese architecture and Japanese art, a lot of these, uh, these early uh, uh, perspective renderings of his clearly have a kind of Japanese quality in the composition and even the colors and the way that they're uh, drawn. Uh, uh, and he did some of these drawings himself, but uh, some were done by his assistant. And in this case, it was done, I, I believe this drawing was done by a, a woman named Marion Mahoney, who also was one of, she uh, uh, was a kind of student of Wright's and learned architecture in, uh, uh, in his office, and then went on to have a, uh, uh, somewhat of a career herself. Though, of course, at, at this time, at the beginning of the, of the 20th century, um, it was very difficult for, um, for women to break into the field of architecture. And I'll say a little more about that, I think, next, next time when we look briefly at the, uh, um, at the career of uh, Julia Morgan in, um, here in California, one of the, um, uh, one of the uh, uh, first uh, uh, women architect who really had a, um, a career that could be considered uh, successful and, and important. But uh, Wright um, uh, trained a, a number of, uh, of women over the years in his office. And, Marion Mahoney was one of them, and in particular, she was a very uh, uh, skilled uh, 
brilliant uh, architectural draftsman, and I think this is one of her drawings. Some of the best of these uh, renderings are by her. Well, the, the traits of the, of the prairie house that are, are emphasized or revealed, I think, by this uh, drawing are, first of all, its integration into the landscape. You can see even that, that, uh, that plants uh, and foliage are uh, incorporated into the house itself with these planters that are, are, are built into, the, uh, into these terraces. And even on the upper floor, there are they're planting boxes which are included into, into the, uh, the house itself with the idea that, uh, that plants would, uh, would grow over these parts of the uh, house. Uh, so this clearly goes back to that, um, that picturesque uh, a romantic as, uh, idea of, of nature and integrating it into a house that we recall from, say, from uh, Davis and Downing's uh, picturesque cottages. Also, the overall form of the house is, is unified, certainly under these uh, great uh, uh, roofs, but still there's a, a lot of complexity of the parts, which often interpenetrate into, uh, into one another. We can see in the plan itself that there's a kind of uh, a cruciform uh, uh, plan where it seems as though the parts uh, there's an interpenetration of these, uh, these uh, parts of the house, but then, and then extend out in all directions, giving the house a kind of um, vitality and a sense of uh, movement. And uh, that, of course, is emphasized by these uh, uh, roofs, which uh, extend out uh, from, the, from the house and then over these areas, like here, the Port Cochere again, or an entranceway, but also over here, where there's a, a terrace. And if you look at the, at the plan here, this part is, actually, is this uh, terrace. Uh, you're, here we see the, the piers which hold up the end of it down there if you relate, again, the plan and the, and the perspective drawing. And this dotted line is the, is the roof which extends out over the, uh, over the terrace and uh, sort of points in, to the directions where the, the, the house, uh, the sense of movement of the house into nature. Well, Wright uh, spoke about all of these things when he wrote about uh, these designs and about the prairie house architecture. And he spoke about the, the traditional house as simply being a, a box or a series of boxes. And he said that he wanted to break open the box of traditional architecture. And this led him to make all sorts of, uh, of innovations. For example, in the, uh, the floor plan of, uh, of these houses, uh, whole walls were given over to windows or doors. And here we can see this if we look at the uh, at this plan where there's a whole series of, uh, of, of doors leading out onto this terrace and down here is, as well that are uh, banked together so that it's as if the whole wall has been uh, opened up and uh, the space can flow from the inside to the outside. You may wonder, if we're looking at this plan, why, it's, why the, um, uh, the uh, identifying words are in uh, German, Eintritt and Wohnzimmer and so forth, and it's because uh, this is a plan which was published in uh, 1910 in, a, uh, in the first great publication that documented all of Wright's uh, early work. And what's interesting is that it was done in, in Germany rather than the United States. Uh, already by 1910, there was great interest in Wright's work in, um, in Europe, and there was this major publication of his, um, of his work. In some ways, he was more appreciated in, in Germany than, uh, than in America. And this, this is another interesting aspect, of course, of, of Wright's work, that he was uh, probably the first American architect who really made a major impact in, in, in Europe. I think I mentioned that H.H. Uh, that H. Richardson was known and appreciated in Europe, and Louis Sullivan was a, as well. So by this time, uh, European architects were, being, were certainly interested in what was happening in America, but their interest in Wright uh, was much greater than any uh, previous architect. And he had a really major influence on um, an impact on the development of modern architecture in Europe. So for, at, at, from this point on, we can clearly say that, that American architecture is as important as European architecture. And it's not just a question, as it was in the colonial period and the early 19th century, of all the influences coming from Europe to America. And Wright, more than anyone else, really puts, puts America on the uh, architectural map internationally. So, the, um, so these spaces opening onto one another. Also, the, if we look at the, uh, the, the rooms in the plan here, they're related in a different way from earlier uh, uh, rooms in traditional architecture. Rather than being these separate boxes just divided off from one another that Wright uh, said he wanted to destroy, if we look at the living room here, here's the fireplace up here, 
And if we uh, sort of trace the boundaries of where the living room actually is, we would say that it goes like that. Okay, but then here's the dining room, and there's another little fireplace, a smaller fireplace uh, off there. So in a sense, the dining room boundaries are like this. This is actually just a, a wooden screen that you sort of see through. So it means that this area here doesn't really belong to either the living room or the dining room, or maybe it belongs to both. There's an ambiguity about it. And, um, and that suggests a kind of fluidity of space that one, you know, there's a kind of a diagonal suggested or suggested that one is supposed to look and, and move in from, from this space into the other spaces. And there's not a clear boundary. It creates it's a, 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 an ambiguity or complexity that was one of the things that, uh, that, that Wright was, uh, was fascinated in here. So there are all sorts of uh, new ideas that he's exploring that can, are revealed in the, uh, even in the floor plans of his houses. Also, you notice that in the dining room, the, um, the, the, the end of it down here is actually triangular in, in shape. It almost does, and, and, and again, w uh, largely uh, windows looking out. And it's as if there, it's a kind of a, uh, a direction or a directional arrow almost pointing toward nature outside uh, and, and um, uh, creating an extension of the space inside. I have a view of this dining room, but um, it's, um, it doesn't do the room justice. It's an old, one of these uh, old, dark, black and white photographs uh, that uh, uh, don't give a sense of, uh, make that room look uh, very dark. In fact, these rooms were filled with light because of the uh, large numbers of windows uh, in them. And also, and, and light was one of the things that, that Wright was uh, exploring, different ways to bring light into a room. Uh, with, so that there were not only windows uh, on, the so on the walls, but also skylights often that would let light in in a different kind of uh, way. And then uh, different, uh, the Wright was also experimenting with, uh, with lighting effects created by light fixtures. Uh, electrical uh, lighting was, was relatively new. And he was, uh, explored different ways of creating um, lighting. I think I have another view of uh, another one of these prairie houses, a larger one the interior room where you get a little more sense of how, how uh, large amounts of light come in from these windows banked together and then a group of them up here, again, some skylights. Another thing he did was to create uh, bands that would, uh, would go around the, uh, uh, a room like this, and in some cases, two bands that uh, would create a space up here where he would put electric lighting that, would, uh, be, that you wouldn't see the actual light bulbs but it would light these ceilings uh, uh, that he designed so carefully with these, with these patterns. And it really created, it was one, one of the first uh, cases I know of, of what's now uh, come to be called cove lighting in uh, rooms. And he really, that was one of his innovations. There are all sorts of, of uh, practical and down to, down to uh, earth uh, technical innovations that he made for uh, things like lighting and heating and other things in, in, in houses. And um, I think I have one other view of an in uh, interior of one of these houses that points out that he also designed stained glass windows and doors uh, that uh, were amazingly uh, innovative in terms of the, uh, the, the, the decorative motifs that he uh, used, often based on, on plant forms. Uh, here, a kind of, uh, some kind of a uh, hanging, probably a wisteria uh, pattern, but that has been, but that he um, abstracts to create a kind of geometric, uh, 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 something that, that's both geometric and uh, suggests natural forms. But he was always careful in, in, in designing these stained glass windows. Stained glass was popular around the turn of the century, uh, of course. Um, one thinks of Tiffany glass windows and so forth. But the difference with, with, with Wright was that he never wanted his windows to be completely colored glass so that they would be opaque. He always wanted a large part of the window to be, to be clear glass so that one would see through in this screen-like kind of way. He liked creating a, a screen so that one would see either from one room to another or from inside to outside the house in, in, a, in a way that's ambiguous. Am I, is this really open or is it partly closed? There's always this uh, kind of subtle uh, uh, complexity or ambiguity in the relationship between these uh, spaces. The, um, let's look at a, uh, a photograph of the front of the Willis house, just that you can compare with the drawing on the, um, 
on the left there, and we see again these windows banked together upstairs as, as well in the bed. This is the bedroom up here, and the windows go all the way from from one uh, uh, side of the room to the other. In these walls, with the this this is an open area. This is where this um, uh, planting box is, as you can see on the uh, rendering on the right, that the roof extends way over it. Also, the windows go from uh, uh, all the way up to the top of the wall, to the underside of the roof, what's called the soffit of the, uh, of the roof. And what it means is that this the, uh, it gives the impression that the whole wall has been removed here, all the way up to the, uh, uh, to the ceiling. And especially from inside a room like this, you have the feeling that the wall's been removed and that one is, uh, is really uh, almost outdoors. So again, this, this idea of a, a fluid space, or space that moves from in, inside to outside dissolving or destroying the box of traditional architecture, as he uh, pointed out. One other, another smaller house of his, oops, that's not where I wanted, I wanted to be on the other side, of, uh, again, of this uh, period in the, the first decade of the 20th century, another one of these prairie houses, where you can see that the windows even wrap around the corner, so it's as if the whole corner has been uh, uh, removed. Well, in the, um, in the first decade of the 20th century, Wright uh, built dozens of these um, prairie-style houses throughout the Midwest and in other parts of the, the country as well, as his work became um, known nationally. But each house was, uh, was different, uh, depending on the um, nature of the site and other local conditions and the resources or uh, lifestyle of the uh, clients. And this reflected Wright's uh, principles of design, which he summed up uh, often with the, with the term organic. And this, uh, this word organic, which is often applied to, uh, to Wright's work, is, um, is actually uh, hard to, to find very precisely. It's hard to really pin down exactly what he meant by it. But certainly, in, in part, it expressed the, uh, this idea that each design should be individual and should grow out of its, um, uh, first of all, its sight and uh, the building materials that are appropriate for it, and the, uh, the functions that it's meant to uh, serve. All of these things um, integrated so that the building evolves, in a sense, uh, in, a, in a natural way and has its own uh, character. So all of these houses are, uh, are different and interesting to study, but perhaps the most dramatic one, and, and uh, the most famous of these prairie houses, I guess, is the Roby House in Chicago. So let's look at that for a, for a minute. The, um, here again we see the uh, plans. The, um, this is a, a, a more urban site. It's in Chicago, uh, near the University of Chicago. It's actually owned by the university now on a, on a smaller lot than some of these others. And yet it, uh, there's still this attempt to ex make it extend into nature. This is the, the lower floor where one enters here at the back of the house. That's also typical of Wright, that often one enters in a circuitous kind of way uh, to create a kind of complex uh, of the path that one takes. But then one moves up into the main floor of the house. The living room and dining room are actually on the upper level. All sorts of innovative things that he does with house plans. And if we just, uh, it's a, a complex house in some ways. It a, was a, a, more, a more affluent, uh, family that built it than some of his other houses. And you can see they're actually servants' uh, quarters. But if we just look at the, um, at the living and dining room area, we can see that, in a sense, it's, it's just it's one large space that, that has a, uh, a, a fireplace core here. Uh, and we see this rising up as a prominent feature, the fireplace, which often acts as a kind of pivot in his uh, uh, plans that the house seems to revolve around. And there's this uh, movement and fluidity but around a very stable core, the fireplace, which suggests this idea of the, of the family hearth as the, as the stable core. So the, there's the fireplace here and also the stairs that come up behind it. But the space flows around that, the living and dining room space that uh, can be seen as one space. And when you're in the, in the dining room, for example, you look down the whole length here. I don't, there, it's, it's hard to photograph the interior, so I don't have slides of the, these interior spaces. But then the space also extends out uh, at the end, uh, again, a number of uh, uh, one of these uh, triangular-shaped uh, uh, ends for the living room extends out onto the uh, the terrace, which we see on the left there in the photograph, with the um, the roof cantilevering out beyond that. And even though, when when you look at the plan, you can see that this cantilevered roof is not really is not very uh, long. It doesn't extend out a great distance beyond the um, 
the end of the room, and yet somehow it looks as though it does when you, uh, when you look at it from the outside. And this is as a result of a number of little tricks that, that Wright uses, visual tricks. For example, I think the fact that this is triangular uh, is on purpose partly because it means that when you look from a, from a 45 degree angle from the street, as we're looking in this photograph, you don't really see this as the end of the room because you're seeing beyond it there. It's a sort of a subtle point, but it makes the, the roof seem to extend out farther than it, uh, than it really does. This um, cantilever is one of, perhaps one of the most um, uh, impressive uses of a, of a cantilever in, uh, in architecture, certainly up to this time or even later, perhaps surpassed in Frank Lloyd Wright's work only by the, uh, the great cantilevers in, uh, in falling water of, from the 1930s, which could also be seen as, uh, as one of these, uh, uh, basically a prairie house, but now handled in a different way in response to a different kind of, uh, uh, of site. But uh, all of these things are uh, 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 suggested and carried out in the, in the Roby House. Getting back to the Roby House, another view, a detail of these uh, windows under the, again, go right up to the soffit of the uh, roof, under this cantilevered uh, roof, and that have uh, this uh, irregular uh, quality set at angles to make the wall look less substantial, less box-like, again, destroying the traditional box of um, American architecture. Well, these prairie houses really had a revolutionary impact on architecture in America and also Europe, as, uh, as I suggested. A new way of handling architectural space, especially domestic architecture in, in, in Wright's work of this period. And in a later lecture, we'll see how these principles shaped more modest American houses. Most of these were for relatively affluent uh, uh, people, though not all of them. But now in the remaining um, time today, I'd like to look at a couple of Wright's um, early designs for non-domestic buildings. Not all of his early architecture is uh, houses, though most of it is. And let's look at a couple of his uh, non-domestic buildings. Again, we'll see a great variety in his work, each one of them uh, contributing something else and exploring different problems. First, a church he designed in this um, uh, early prairie house period or the, the first decade of the 20th century. This is called Unity Temple it's in uh, Oak Park, this suburb outside Chicago where he practiced and lived and was built in 1906. And on the right here, I show you another one of these uh, beautiful drawings. Uh, can that be focused a little uh, more, Jill? Maybe the slide on the right, it may just be a little fuzzy, but it's, it's another one of these beautiful drawings, which again, I, yes, thank you, I think better, thanks. Um, which, um, may have been actually drawn by, uh, by Marion uh, Mahoney, one of these uh, beautiful drawings that has this kind of semi-Japanese uh, quality about it. Well, this um, uh, uh, church, Unity Temple, is interesting for a number of, uh, of reasons, but probably the most important is the material that it's made of. It's uh, built of reinforced concrete. And you remember we looked at uh, 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 last uh, week at um, at reinforced concrete, the beginnings of reinforced concrete a bit, and specifically uh, looking at the Stanford Museum, which was one of the uh, first major buildings of reinforced concrete built in, uh, in 1890. And, uh, but by the time that Wright built Unity Temple in 1906, reinforced concrete was still a new material, which was not really considered a respectable uh, material for, uh, for public buildings or for real architecture, architecture with a capital A. And so um, this is part of the early development of this material, reinforced concrete. And it's interesting, I think, to compare it with the Stanford Museum to see how they're, they're treated uh, differently. And as we saw, in the case of the Stanford Museum, technologically it was, it was important, Ernest Ransom working out details of how the, uh, how the uh, reinforcing bars would actually uh, 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 work in, in the uh, concrete. That as you remember, the process, of course, is that forms are built usually wooden forms. Uh, the reinforcing bars are placed in the forms. The concrete is, is poured in. And then when it's hardened, the forms are, are removed. So it's a, the, the term that's sometimes used for a material like reinforced concrete is that it's a plastic material, that it can be poured and it takes the shape of whatever it's, uh, it's in. And, um, but in the Stanford Museum, you remember that even though the, the, the technology was very advanced. The building looks like a traditional classical building. And in fact, 
uh, was uh, designed to make it look like it was actually built out of stone with these, uh, the, the concrete cast to, to create uh, this uh, impression of, of blocks of stone. And, but Wright, with this idea of organic architecture that, that should, should grow out of the conditions and the materials that are actually used, did, clearly did not want to disguise the material as anything else. So he tries to devise a new ways of dealing with, in a sense, create a new aesthetic for reinforced concrete. And for one thing, he, he shows clearly that it's monolithic. We see these, these large surfaces of the exterior of the building are not divided into, uh, into parts or bands or blocks that make it look like uh, that it could be blocks of stone. He wants us to see that these are uh, uh, continuous surfaces of a monolithic um, plastic material. But when we look at the details, we, um, we see that he's doing some other things as well. He, he's interested in ornament. Uh, like uh, Lewis Sullivan, he's always, uh, and throughout the rest of his career, he's fascinated in archite with architectural ornament. But he, 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 he wants to create a new kind of ornament here, which is appropriate for reinforced concrete. And if we think about it, I think we can, we can see how it's appropriate. Uh, when you, th when you think about how one creates uh, ornament uh, in reinforced concrete, you realize that unlike um, something like stone, where one would carve the, um, the, uh, the ornament or decoration in, in concrete it has to be uh, uh, poured. And therefore, the, uh, the ornament is really the negative of the form that one builds to pour the concrete in. In other words, uh, one has to, to, to have this poured like this, it, um, one has to have, build the form, which is the negative of this. And it would be very difficult uh, in a wooden form to create curving forms, for example, or the traditional kind of architectural ornament that one might normally find on a, um, a column or a pier like this. So Frank Lloyd Wright d develops and conceives a new type of ornament, which is made completely of, of um, uh, geometric uh, right angles like this that actually is relatively easy to make a form in the negative for it uh, by using strips of wood and little blocks of wood that are, are built into the form. And so you can see that he's thinking of, of, of how one creates an aesthetic of architectural ornament and forms that is appropriate to the technology of reinforced concrete. And this is just completely typical of the way that Frank Lloyd Wright thinks about all aspects of, uh, of architecture. The, um, let's see, I maybe have one other view of uh, the Unity Temple. Nope, it was on the right-hand side. Here, the interior, uh, where, again, the reinforced concrete is important to the, to the form of the building. In particular, the, uh, the ceiling, where reinforced concrete, with, a, with its, its strength, allows these beams to, uh, to be open here with these large coffers that he can put the, uh, a glass in for the, the skylights that let, let light into the inside of this um, church. One other um, of his uh, non-domestic buildings looked at uh, quickly. This is called the Larkin Building. It no longer e exists. It was built in Buffalo, New York in 1904, so we only know it from these old photographs. It was the headquarters for a mail order company in, a, um, an, in an industrial part of, um, of Buffalo, New York. And so he wanted to, he, he thought about what would be an appropriate form of, for this type of building. It's essentially, it's, it's rather like the skyscrapers that uh, Lewis Sullivan and other were, others were designing in, uh, uh, in Chicago in that it uh, has a lot of offices in it. But Wright wants to, to come up with a, with a new way rather than just making it a series of cells and boxes, as, as Sullivan uh, described his own skyscrapers. He, his Wright's fascination with with space that's fluid and moves and uh, opens onto one thing and another, wants him to create a, a new form of the, of the office building. But he f uh, realizes that it's an inappropriate to have it open out to nature, as he does with his domestic houses, uh, because it's in, a, uh, uh, in an industrial part of, uh, of uh, the city of Buffalo and uh, wouldn't be appropriate. So he, he turns it inward, and the space uh, uh, flows into the central uh, courtyard space with a great skylight above, as you can see. And uh, so he's exploring with a, a different way, a different notion of, of the way a skyscraper could, uh, I, I mean, the way a, an office building could work, something which he later develops in his career in a number of interesting directions in more dramatic buildings, such as the Johnson 
uh, company headquarters building that he built in the 1930s in Racine, uh, uh, Wisconsin. And uh, where again, the, uh, the office building turns inward with these floors that open onto a central space with skylights, except that here, he's using much bolder reinforced concrete uh, forms, these uh, uh, slim uh, uh, reinforced concrete columns that hold the whole thing up. Uh, so you, he's exploring a different idea, as you can see here, for, for non-domestic uh, architecture as well. But nevertheless, I think it was his prairie houses that were most important to American architecture, opening up the American house to new concepts of space and of the relationship of a house to its physical environment. And finally, I'd just like to show a couple of views of, um, of his own house, Taliesin, that, was, uh, that he began in 1911 after he had gone back to, uh, to Wisconsin to, uh, uh, to live and to have his, uh, uh, his office and studio. He began building it in 1911 and then it was rebuilt a couple of times. And here we, um, we see all of these elements that he had been exploring, breaking open the box uh, and creating fluid space uh, both inside and outside the house. Here in the living room we see the the space rises up into a, the, the ceilings are not all the same height, and one sees up into other parts of the, uh, of the house. The horizontal and vertical aspects playing off against one another and inter, uh, interpenetrating uh, spaces. The use of natural materials, uh, unpainted uh, wood and the natural uh, uh, stone, which is the, the same outside and inside the house, so that one, uh, so that there's this uh, connection, not a, uh, a sharp division between the um, outside and the inside. An uh, organic uh, relationship, certainly, with uh, nature. So uh, integrated with nature that it's uh, really hard to photograph the exterior of the, uh, of the house, which is true often of Frank Lloyd Wright's houses. Here, another interior view where one can sense some of these things. And I'd like to conclude with a passage written by Wright himself about uh, this house, and it suggests, I think, that American tradition of the, of the picturesque and romantic uh, attitudes toward uh, nature, and gives uh, maybe a sense of, uh, of Wright's uh, uh, passionate views about this. He says, Taliesin was to be a combination of stone and wood as they met in the aspect of the hills round about. The lines of the hills were the lines of the roofs, the slopes of the hills their slopes. The plastered surfaces of the light wood walls set back into shade beneath broad eaves were like the flat stretches of sand in the river below, and the same in color, for that is where the material that covered them came from. I knew well by now that no house could ever be on any hill or on anything. It should be of the hill, belonging to it, so hill and house could live together, each the happier for the other. Well, when we pick up next time, we'll look at um, examples of architecture in California during this period.